You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. It's a long way to Tipperary, it's a long way to go, it's a long way to Tipperary, to the sweetest girl I know, goodbye Piccadilly. Hello everyone and welcome to the History of the Great War episode 195, Between Two Giants. This week, a big thank you goes out to Ralph for becoming a supporter of this podcast on Patreon, where he now gets access to special ad-free versions of all of these episodes, plus special Patreon-only episodes, like the one that's featuring this month on Fortress Shimashal. If that sounds interesting to you, head on over to patreon.com slash history of the great war to find out more information. In this episode, we continue our series on the countries of Eastern Europe after the war, and this time we're going to focus on Poland. The history of Poland is one of foreign invasions, partitions, and destruction. Over the centuries, the lack of natural barriers, along with other reasons we will not dive into here, have prevented the country, be it just Poland or as the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, from adequately protecting itself. During the First World War, the area that would eventually become Poland was split between three different empires, the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Russian Empire. During the early years of the war, there was almost constant fighting on Polish territory, with first the Russians marching west, and then the Germans and Austrians marching east. Eventually, the fighting would mostly move to the east, but that left all of Poland under German and Austro-Hungarian control. Throughout all of these events, the strong and persistent Polish nationalism continued to grow. Both sides in the war would try to use this movement to their advantage, especially after the Russian Revolution in 1917. By 1918, the Polish independence movement would be split in two. There were leaders in Paris who were working with the Allies to try and create the new country through political means. This effort was led by Ignacy Paderewski and Roman Domowski. While while these were working with leaders in Paris, back in Poland, under the leadership of Joseph Pilsudski, the new Polish nation was attempting to insert itself in the region and resist Russian incursions from the east. The leadership of these men would help bring Poland out of the post-war turmoil and into the future, even if they had vastly different ideas about how to create the new country and its best path into the future. Paderewski had been born in a small village in eastern Poland in 1860. Even as a child, he had been drawn towards the piano, and over the course of his life, he would become a world-renowned composer. In the decades before the war, he would tour the world, making stops in many major cities. This made him one of the most recognizable Poles in the world. When the war started, Paderewski would spend most of his time in America, where he would champion the cause for Polish independence with American politicians, eventually becoming good friends with Wilson and his close advisor, Edward House. This was important because America was a very critical piece of the Polish national cause. There were more Poles in America than anywhere in the world outside of Poland, and this made the Polish vote important in the United States. This gave them political power. After making his case to the president, in January 1917, Wilson added the creation of a united, independent, and autonomous Poland as one of his 14 points. In December 1918, Paderewski would leave the United States on his way to Paris, and at the conference he would be favored by the Americans as the future leader of Poland. While Paderewski and Domowski were in Paris, back in Warsaw, the Polish military was led by Joseph Pilsudski. Pilsudski could had not have been more different than Paderewski. He had been a Polish revolutionary for most of his life. He had previously spent time in Siberia for some of his revolutionary activity, but this punishment just hardened his resolve. 
When the war started, he would lead a group of Polish units that fought for the Central Powers against Russia. Now, his goal with this was to defeat Russia before turning his men and his efforts to breaking free of Germany and Austria-Hungary. When the Germans found out about this plan, he was arrested, and he would spend the rest of the war in the fortress of Magdeburg. While this put his plans on hold, it probably ended up helping him obtain his future leadership position. His stint in the German fortress made him something of a legend among Polish nationalists, and when he was released in November 1918, he would become the natural leader of the independence movement at a time where it absolutely needed military leadership if it hoped to survive. The third leader that would play a critical role in forming the future Poland was Roman Domowski. Domowski had been the leader of the Polish National Committee. This was the official group that had been formed during the war to work with the Allies in Paris to get official recognition for a future Poland. This fulfilled much the same role as the Czechoslovak National Committee that we discussed last episode. These leaders had very different views on the best path forward for Poland. Paderewski and Domowski looked to Paris and its leaders at the conference to gain legitimacy and assistance in the creation of the country. Pilsudski did not really trust these foreign politicians, and instead put his efforts into making the Polish military and central government as strong as possible so that it could weather any storm that the country's neighbors could throw at it. This difference in opinion led to very divergent goals for the Polish leaders. At times, there would be disagreements worked out in Paris, agreements that were then sent to Pilsudski who would just ignore them. The relationship between the leaders would never really come together, and eventually Paderewski would remove himself from his position, and Pilsudski would gain full control of Poland. Now, the differences between Paderewski and Pilsudski were nothing compared to the gulf between Domowski and Pilsudski. They had vastly different views on what the country should look like, and it was only after concerted efforts by Paderewski that he was able to convince the two leaders to work together at all. This spirit of common purpose would only last so long, though, and in late 1919, a group of Domowski supporters in Poland would attempt a coup against Pilsudski. It was unsuccessful. Part of the tension between the two leaders was the fact that they both had their own armies. The Polish military in Paris was made up of Polish exiles and others who had made their way to Paris during the war. Back in Poland, the military was primarily made up of veterans of wartime armies that had surrounded the country. This was just one reason that the two sides were so different. A key supporter of Polish independence was the Americans. In January 1917, Wilson had publicly promised to make a united and independent Poland. This was important to Wilson from a principal's perspective and also as a way to get those Polish votes. Even though he supported their independence, and in that support he would have very little real resistance from other leaders, he did not really have any specifics on what he wanted. This put Poland in a similar position to Czechoslovakia, where there was support for the concept of creating a new country, but the people of the country would be mostly responsible for setting up its territory. The French and British both supported Polish independence, but they had very different views on how important it was. The British took the same view that they had on many of the Eastern European questions. They were fine with what the Poles were trying to do, but the British did not want to do anything to actually help. They certainly didn't want to spend any money or send any troops into the area. The French saw Poland as an important piece in their Eastern European plans, and so they pushed for a stronger Poland at every possible opportunity. As with other complicated topics, the Supreme Council would create a commission, in this case named the Commission on Polish Affairs. It would be in charge of determining the borders of the new country, which would be no easy knot to untie. Poland has very few geographical features to anchor a border on, and so just like in other areas where these features were lacking, trying to draw borders was incredibly difficult, and, was always, and it was always forced to be a compromise of some kind. There were four major borders that had to be determined by the committee, and these were the Polish borders with Germany in the north and the south, with Czechoslovakia in the south, and with Russia in the east. The most contentious of these borders would be in the north, on the border with Germany, because the Polish leaders wanted access to the sea. Specifically, they wanted access to the Baltic Sea. There was just one problem. There was Germany in the way. The only way to provide this access to the Baltic would be to cut through Germany, specifically through East Prussia. 
This area was heavily populated by Germans, and even though there were some historic claims that could be made by the Poles to this region, it had been Prussian territory for centuries. The Polish leaders were of course far more concerned with the future than the past, and so they favored a route to the Baltic through the city of Danzig. The population of the city itself was over 90% German, although there were a good number of Poles in the surrounding countryside. This was probably the best option that the conference had, but they still hesitated to give the area over to Poland. It would place millions of Germans inside of Polish territory, which was believed to be a recipe for future problems. There was also administrative problems, like who would own the previously German railways, and who would have access to those railways since many connected East Prussia with the rest of Germany, and that would be going through Polish territory if the corridor was created. When the Polish delegates heard that the Allies were perhaps reconsidering the creation of the Danzig Corridor, Paderewski would say, quote, Danzig is indispensable to Poland, which cannot breathe without its window to the sea. Eventually, the area would be given over to Poland, and it would end up causing many problems. Providing Poland with access to the sea was just one facet of a much larger conversation about the Polish border with Germany. This was an important topic, of course, but also really the only one that the Supreme Council at the conference could really control, for reasons we'll discuss later. The real sticking point with the German-Polish border was Upper Silesia. This was an area to the southwest of Poland where it met with Germany. It was an area desired by both the Polish and the Germans due to the coal and industrial output of the region. This area accounted for roughly a quarter of Germany's coal output, 80% of its zinc, and a third of its lead. It also contained industrial infrastructure to turn those raw materials into manufactured goods. The Poles wanted the region, pointing to the large Polish population in the southern areas of Silesia. The Germans wanted to hold on to it due to the large German population in the north, and they also claimed that it would be impossible for the country to meet its economic obligations that were being put into the peace treaty without this critical industrial region. The Supreme Council was split. Clemenceau wanted to give the region to Poland with no strings attached, a policy perfectly in line with his objective of making Germany as weak as possible. Wilson and the Americans wanted to hold a plebiscite in the area to let the people decide. Eventually, Wilson would get his way, and all the leaders would agree to a plebiscite. Now, this plebiscite would not occur until March 1921, after the Poles had done everything to delay it, and it really did not end up helping very much. The North and West, heavily German, voted to join with Germany. The South, heavily Polish, voted to join with Poland. Totally expected. However, the area in the middle was very confused and very divided. This was a problem because it was in the middle that the most really important areas were located. Most of those mines, most of those factories were all in this middle region. Eventually, the decision on what to do would be handed over to the League of Nations, which would decide to give most of the area over to Poland. In Germany, this loss was just as bad as what happened in the north around Danzig. Not only did many Germans end up in Poland, but there was also a good amount of economic power moving to one of its neighbors. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. 
Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. While the northern and western Polish borders were with Germany, in the south the new country bordered another new state, Czechoslovakia. The two countries got along decently well in Paris at the conference, and there were leaders within both countries that would push for even closer relations between the new nations. Both Mazariak and Paderewski wanted the countries to be even closer, with both hoping to create a large eastern alliance to protect their countries from their much larger neighbors. However, others within both governments were obsessed with the territory between the two countries, and how there were disagreements about who was getting what, and precisely what the borders would be. During 1919, there would even be small armed clashes between military units of the two countries. During the summer, a Polish-Czechoslovak commission would meet in the city of Krakow to try and solve the differences between the two countries with varying degrees of success. The specific border questions would eventually be resolved with the, with the assistance of the League of Nations, but the larger discussion of an alliance between the two countries would not come to a successful conclusion. This was mostly due to the fact that Pilsudski favored alliances with countries in the east, so he put his efforts into trying to build relations with Lithuania and Ukraine instead of looking south and west to Czechoslovakia. The primary point of contention between Czechoslovakia and Poland was Galicia. Galicia was a border area of the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, and it was also where most of the early fighting on the Eastern Front happened during the war. Much like other border regions, the area was a mix of different ethnicities, with Poles, Ruthenians, Ukrainians, to name just a few. When the war ended, Galicia actually declared its independence, although this independence would not last very long. There was fighting in the area as both local militia and outside armies fought over bits of territory. Some groups wanted to remain independent, while others wanted to join neighboring countries, like Poland. Support for joining Poland was strongest in the north, which had a huge majority of Poles within the cities, although the countryside was more heavily populated by the Ruthenians. For the south, the majority was heavily in favor of the Ruthenians in both the cities and the countryside, but it seemed that nobody really cared what the Ruthenians wanted. They actually sent delegates to Paris, but that did not help them get any rulings in their favor. One of the problems was that for almost the entire duration of the conference, the Supreme Council did not have any set policy towards Russia and the Ukraine, which this area bordered. Wilson would claim that one of the primary reasons that the Supreme Council and the conference as a whole could not solve the Galatia problem was that there were other questions that had to be answered as well. He would say, quote, It is very difficult for us to intervene without having a better understanding of our position vis-a-vis -vis the Ukrainians or the Bolsheviks. While Paris was indecisive, Poland was the exact opposite. They moved in with military units and they firmly established control. For the next four years, they would maintain this control, until eventually in 1923, their position, possession would be recognized by other countries. Speaking of those countries in the east, the borders for Poland to the east basically did not exist in 1919. The area was in chaos due to a number of reasons. The war had passed back and forth over the territory. Then both of the Russian revolutions in 1917. Then the Germans and Austrians had given up the territory in late 1918. And then the Russian Civil War really heated up. The conference was absolutely powerless to really help the Poles when it came to their eastern borders. They had no power in the region, and they barely knew who was in control of what at any given time. The Supreme Council would try to intervene, they drew some borders, and they tried to get the Polish armies to stick to them, and they would later try and work with the Bolsheviks as well. However, both sides were unwilling to work with the leaders that were a thousand miles away in Paris. This area would be in turmoil for far longer than just the duration of the Paris Peace Conference, and it would involve a full-scale war between Poland and Soviet Russia, a topic we will cover in greater detail in later episodes. One topic related to Poland's eastern border that did get some discussion among the Polish political leaders was a union with Lithuania. 
During the last period of Polish independence, before the partitions, Poland had been part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and there were some in Poland that wanted to recreate this union. While the union would have found some support within Poland, among the Lithuanians it enjoyed almost no support. The Lithuanian delegates in Paris would speak out strongly against any kind of union with Poland, and there would be fighting between the two countries in 1920. The Bolsheviks were the third party in this fighting, and it would not be until after they were removed from the picture that a truce would finally be signed between Poland and Lithuania. Crucially, this uh, treaty would leave the city of Vilnius, the historic capital of Lithuania, in Polish hands, a situation that would cause continued tensions between the two countries until the entire region was reorganized after the Second World War. One of the features of the discussions around the future of Poland involved the rights and status of minorities, both within Poland but also around Eastern Europe as a whole. These discussions were prompted by the activities of many groups within these areas, groups that took advantage of the disorder in the region after the war to commit atrocities against various minority groups. Jewish civilians were a frequent target, with some of the worst acts done against them by Polish units. However, these atrocities were not in any way limited to targeting Jewish peoples, and they were not all done by Polish units. Everybody was a possible target. When news of the events reached Paris, the idea of some kind of minority bill of rights would begin to gain some serious traction. The first discussions would occur during, this, during the creation of the League of Nations Covenant. Uh, Wilson would be the first to propose the wording for what would be included. He wanted to bind all of the League members to a pledge of equal treatment of all peoples. This equality would be given to, quote, all racial and national minorities. In May, the topic would come up again in the Supreme Council meetings, and Wilson tried again to bring back basically the exact same idea. During these discussions, Wilson would also declare that he wanted these rights to specifically be applied to Poland. He was so adamant about Poland due to the personal support that he had given to the Polish independence movement, and also due to the various decisions that were being made in Paris. It was clear that the Poland that would be created by the conference would have a huge number of minorities within it. This combined with news of the new atrocities that were arriving in Paris seemingly every other week pushed the other leaders to agree. This push eventually got an agreement completed within the Supreme Council, and it would later be added to the agreements made with several other Eastern European countries. The agreement attempted to deal with three primary topics. The most important were contained in the first eight articles, which were the core of the vision that Wilson had presented during the League of Nations conversations months before. It prevented governments from putting in place any law that discriminated against minorities. It also ensured, quote, full and complete protection of life and liberty to all inhabitants, without distinction of birth, nationality, language, race, or religion. A good chunk of the agreement would also deal with citizenship. Uh, basically, the countries were not allowed to just kick people out of their countries in mass due to their ethnicity, religion, or where they came from, or whatever. Poland would eventually agree to all of this, but only after some resistance. This agreement was probably one of the better things, in, in my opinion, to come out of the conference, but it would not end up mattering as much as its authors had originally hoped. The enforcement procedures were not very robust, and so many of the signatories of the agreement, while not totally ignoring it, would at the very least take the broadest possible interpretations of its clauses. Also, the leaders of the conference, those on the Supreme Council, were not exactly leading countries that were paragons of minority rights. Racism was rampant in all of the countries on the Supreme Council, and I'm not totally convinced that any of their countries would have been in full compliance with the minorities' rights outlined in the agreement with the other countries. The one event that we have not really discussed at all is that while Poland was negotiating and talking with the politicians in Paris, it was also fighting for its very life. During most of 1919 and 1920, the country would be in open conflict with the Russian Bolsheviks. The fighting would move back and forth over Polish and Russian territory, and the fighting front would swing wildly both east and west. At one point, the Poles were in control of Kiev. Just a few months later, the Russians would be in the city limits of Warsaw. In this fight, the Poles often felt like they were completely alone, with plenty of encouragement and some supplies from the leaders in Paris, but very few men to help with the fight. They were fighting against the international revolution that occupied such a critical part of the Bolshevik agenda and would almost destroy their new country. 
but they would survive, and that wild story will have to wait a few months, at which point we will tell it in full in later episodes. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode as we dive into the relationship between the Paris Peace Conference and those Bolsheviks in Russia.